Welcome to Mexico Unexplained, where we will explore the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. This series presents information based partly on theory and conjecture. The podcaster's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones to the subjects we will examine. Here is your host, Robert Bito. Welcome, and muy bienvenidos to episode number 187 of Mexico Unexplained, where we examine the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. I'm your host, Robert Bito. Nayarit is a state on the Pacific coast of Mexico, bordering the states of Sinaloa, Durango, Zacatecas, and Jalisco. Its territory encompasses pristine beaches, high mountains, and lowland tropical forests. For many years, the Huichol, Cora, Tepehuan, and Mexicanero peoples have called this land their home. The roots of these people run deep in Nayarit, and their culture's legends have endured well into modern times. Here are three. Number one, the warriors and the princess. Many centuries before the arrival of the Spanish, a king named Trigo Mil ruled over several small settlements in the Matatipac Valley. This king exercised his government with great care and was known throughout the land as a noble and just ruler. He had a very beautiful daughter with big black eyes which matched her long straight hair. Her beauty was such that from distant kingdoms they came to meet her and many asked for her hand. Even the mighty emperor of the Aztecs knew her name, Mololoa. Mololoa knew the motives of the people who visited her and so she asked her father to allow her to choose her own suitor. King Trigomil agreed. Time passed and one day the princess met a young man named Tepetl. Tepetl was a skilled warrior of noble aspect and sharp intelligence. Together with Princess Mololoa, he spent every afternoon talking and sharing his dreams and feelings. After a short period of time, Mololoa was falling in love with Tepetl and thought that he could be the one. One day a portly warrior with a strong presence came to King Trigomil. His name was Sangangwe. Eager to see the beautiful woman and prompted by the desire of marriage, the stout warrior requested to see the princess. The king granted his request. When Princess Mololoa heard of the warrior's motives, she explained that she could not return his feelings and therefore she was not going to receive the gifts that he offered. Sangangwe replied to the princess that even against her will she would be his wife, even if he had to kill to make it happen. She was silent and remembered what was said about Sangangwe. He was hated in many towns for being cruel and disrespectful of the will of the people, and he was feared because he supposedly had supernatural powers. Princess Mololoa asked the warrior to please leave her be. Soon after, word spread throughout the Matatipak Valley Kingdom that Princess Mololoa and Tepetl were to be married. Hearing this, Sangangwe exploded in rage and swore that he would prevent the wedding. He shouted that the princess would be his and that he would kill Tepetl. The rage was so great and his screams so loud that they made the earth itself tremble. One morning, with the first light of day, Sangangwe entered the princess's bedroom and abducted her. Upon learning of this, Tepetl immediately went out to find his beloved and defeat the terrible Sangangwe. He searched many places and for many days until he found them. Tepetl caught up with Mololoa and Sangangwe, and a battle ensued between the two warriors. Princess Mololoa managed to break free and fled into the forest. She ran until she could run no more. The princess climbed to the top of a huge rock and sat down, sad and afraid to see from a distance the fight that her beloved was fighting. Sangangwe and Tepetl fought tirelessly and with extraordinary zeal. Both were great warriors and they put forth all of their energy into the fight, because they knew that the princess would be their prize in the end. Sangangwe's fury was so great that he spewed smoke from his eyes and fire from his mouth. Tepetl skillfully dodged the smoke and fire and started to throw small stones at his attacker. 
After a short while, the great warrior Sangangwe was covered completely by the small stones. The fire that came out of Sangangwe's mouth melted the stones and he was imprisoned in a great compact mountain. The entire Matatipak Valley was covered with smoke and ashes that Sangangwe spewed from his prison hill. Meanwhile, Tepetl was looking for Princess Mololoa, but the ash rain was so intense that it impeded his visibility. So he quelled the fire, throwing a huge rock into Sangangwe's mouth. That stone is now the one that divides the Sangangwe volcano in two. Tepetl spent days searching for Princess Mololoa. He built a small platform of stones, and from the top of it he observed the entire valley in search of the princess. Sangangwe, still imprisoned in his volcano, threw out a great breath of fire to try to kill Tepetl. Sangangwe's fire melted Tepetl into that rock lookout he made for himself. Today, that former pile of rocks on which the young man stood to look for the princess is known as Cerro de San Juan. And what of the princess? When observing this tragedy, she began to cry. Her tears first formed a thin trickle of water, but as she never stopped crying, little by little, she transformed herself into a river of crystalline waters that crossed the entire Matatipak Valley until ending in the mighty waters of the Santiago River. Today, the indigenous inhabitants of the Matatipak Valley see daily the rival warriors turned into Sangangwe Volcano and Cerro de San Juan and the beautiful Princess Mololoa, who is still crying, transformed into a river that now bears her name. Number 2. The Mythical Origins of a Turquoise Lake In pre-Hispanic times, there was once a wealthy city-state called Michitzlan in what is now the central part of the Mexican state of Nayarit. It became a rich little kingdom through trade with the Pacific coast and with the larger empires of the Aztecs and Tarascans. A great king and queen ruled Michitzlan and lived in an opulent palace with many servants. They had one child, a daughter, a beautiful young woman named Teposi Lama. As she was the only royal offspring, the king and queen guarded her with extreme care. One day, Teposilama went for a walk in the company of her ladies-in-waiting, when suddenly they saw a wounded deer. As they approached to help the deer, the strong voice of a young man called out to them, to which Teposilama replied, Who are you and what are you doing here? The young warrior responded, I am Pintotli. It was love at first sight between the princess and the young warrior Pintotli. Even though Pintotli was from a rival kingdom to the south, the two vowed to put all political differences aside and promised to see each other as soon as possible. A few weeks later, during an important festival in the city of Michitzlan, Princess Toposilama left the kingdom to see Pintotli. The young woman's father, realizing her absence, questioned her ladies-in-waiting and made them tell him the whereabouts of the princess. The king, with his personal guards, went in search of Teposilama to the place where the ladies had indicated, a hidden corner in a sort of no-man's land between the rival kingdoms. It was there where the king and his guards found Teposilama in the company of Pintotli. When she approached her father, the princess said, My father, I know that my sin is very great, but I'm in love and I humbly ask your permission for me to marry him. The king replied, My daughter will never be in love with one of my worst enemies. He then turned to the guards and said, Take her away, tie her up and don't feed her. So they lashed her to a tree and did the same with Pintotli. Thus, Teposilama and Pintotli remain tied within sight of one another, so close but yet so far. They cried for days and nights at their misfortune until their tears formed the enormous and beautiful turquoise-colored lake known today as the Laguna de San Maria del Oro. Number 3. The Siwanaba 
The story of the Siwanaba is more urban legend or campfire tale told with a modern twist, but has deep indigenous roots studied by anthropologists and folklorists. The latter-day story goes something like this. A couple of decades ago, two men who had an old friendship, and were even compadres, worked from an early age on a plot of land they owned jointly on the outskirts of the town of Rosa Morada. As is common in this type of work, the workday usually extends until late at night. Both seeing that the darkness had crept up on them, they decided to end their day of work and begin the journey back home. They boarded a van and followed the route that they followed every day. However, one of them, the one in the passenger seat, had the need to go to the bathroom, so he asked his compadre to stop on the side of the road. The road lacked lighting at night, with the moon providing the only illumination. With the very dim light of the moon, the man got out of the vehicle and walked away a little. While he stood there relieving himself, he observed off in the distance, through some trees, on the edge of a small lake, a woman standing with her back to him. Why was a woman out in the middle of nowhere after dark? How did she get there? The man started calling the woman, warning her of the danger for being so close to the water. He was afraid she would fall in and drown, and that no one would be able to rescue her in the darkness. There was no response from the woman. The man wanted to help, so he walked through the lightly wooded area to get to her. Just then, when he was a few meters away, the woman turned around and he, horrified, discovered that attached to that beautiful female figure was hiding a horrible and devilish horse face. He did not manage to do anything other than run. When he hurried to his compadre who was waiting for him in the van, he asked him to start the vehicle and leave immediately. His friend asked him the reason for the haste, but he only insisted they leave. After feeling safe upon arriving home, the man related his experience, and since then they agreed never to stop on the road again at night because he feared seeing the horse-headed Siwanaba. The name Siwanaba may come from combining a word from a dead and unknown indigenous language, Siwa, meaning spirit, with the Nahuatl word for woman, Siwatl. Some folklorists believe that Siwanaba is a corruption of the combination of two Nahuatl words, Siwatl, woman, and Mitlatl, meaning net. So Siwanaba was once Siwatl Matlatl, or net woman, referring to the female spirit acting as a snare to entrap unsuspecting men. There are older legends found among both the Aztecs and the Maya of a beautiful young woman dressed in white or completely naked, usually appearing near water or by dry creek beds, always with her head turned away. In the older legends, when the Siwanaba turned her head to face the unsuspecting victim, the head was a horrible skull and not a horse head. This would make sense as horses were introduced by the Spanish and didn't exist in the ancient Mexican civilizations. In some legends, the Siwanaba may appear to a child disguised as his or her mother only to lure the child into the woods to leave him or her there confused and lost. In many versions of the story, both modern and ancient, the Siwanaba is bathing, swimming, or otherwise associated with water. This is not to be confused with La Llorona, for the story of La Llorona, please see Mexico Unexplained episode number 2. The Mexican state of Nayarit is home to many indigenous legends that may date back thousands of years. The three presented here are only a sample of the magic and the mystery. Thank you once again for listening to another episode of Mexico Unexplained. Remember to like and subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Twitter. Tell your friends by sharing these shows with others. Please go to our website, MexicoUnexplained.com, for references, illustrations, and for free access to transcripts of past shows. Please visit Amazon.com to purchase the books Mexico Unexplained and Mexican Monsters to get hard copies of the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. We appreciate your kind attention once again. Until next time, thank you and gracias.
Thank you for listening to another episode of Mexico Unexplained with host Robert Bitto. For show summary, relevant links and commentary, please check out our website at mexicounexplained.com. Like us on Facebook and be a part of the conversation. Adios and hasta la vista.